Why is it important for a man to learn how to connect to his heart? What does it even look like when a man is connected to his heart? And how can a man connect to his heart without also disconnecting from his brain or his balls? Well, in this episode, I dive into those questions and more for useful insights to make a meaningful difference in your life. I've worked with so many deeply well-intentioned men, even highly successful men, business owners, military commanders, even other coaches who couldn't really connect with or feel their own hearts. And they only knew that because despite all their successes, despite having even the relationship they thought they'd always wanted on some deep, essential level, they nonetheless couldn't enjoy it or thrive in the experiencing of it all. And actually, it's a curious and tragic thing that so many men won't begin to even explore what it means to be connected to heart until they've lost what they later realized was most important to them. I had that experience when Sylvie and I broke up just six months into our relationship. At that time, I was experiencing all of the success that I had ever dreamed of. My blogs were being read by millions of people around the world. My coaching practice was thriving and, and I was, you know, admiration and appreciation was pouring in from all over the world. And, and at least until that, that moment that she broke up with me, I'd had the woman of my dreams. And when she broke up with me, everything seemed meaningless. All that success, all of that admiration, the work that I was doing that I loved, it just felt utterly meaningless. And that's not because Sylvie left me, because I didn't have Sylvie anymore, but it's because in that moment, I fully experienced the disconnection from my heart. And it was devastating in a way that I had never accessed or experienced before. In fact, in those few weeks that we were apart, I was, I've never been suicidal and I wasn't suicidal then, but I experienced as it's, it was as if I was walking around in the psychological space within which men commit suicide. Powerful experience. It was a life-changing moment for me. Now, there's certainly a lot of layers to that experience, and maybe Sylvie and I will share that in another episode uh, at some other point in the future, but this is why I am such a big fan of fully empowering women, because so often I see that it's a deeply empowered woman, one who's no longer willing to tolerate a disconnected man's behavior because she's no longer willing to suffer the hurts of his actions, who turns out to be the catalyst for a man to finally realize he must connect with his heart. And I am indeed talking about my journey, my friends. But again, that story for another time. In this episode, I'm going to be diving into my popular blog, Five Signs a Man is Connected to Heart, and of course, sharing some of my personal experiences. And at the end, I'm going to share key practices that you can choose to work with for the next seven days. I'll share five key practices. Just choose one to help you connect more deeply to your heart. So definitely stay tuned to the end of this episode of Men This Way. All right, let's dive. Many men think our power is in our brains or our balls. Our rational brains are supposed to do all the figuring out while our testosterone-filled balls supply the driving force. Intelligence, determination, courage, sheer force of will, these are the masculine convictions of our brains and our balls. And they're absolutely valid and essential in their own way. But when used in isolation from our true power source for too long, they leave us dead inside, unable to deeply connect with life including our intimate partners. When I was a U.S. military officer, I was trained to use those masculine brains and balls convictions to accomplish whatever the mission, whatever the cost. And after 10 years of operating purely on brains and balls alone, I was completely dead inside. I couldn't really laugh. I couldn't at all cry. I had an amazing girlfriend that I couldn't really love because I couldn't feel much of anything. And I didn't realize then that the military takes to the extreme what modern culture idolizes, the prioritization of rationality over emotion, 
the worship of intellectual understanding over embodied knowing. You see, the military intentionally disconnects the brains and balls from embodied knowing because that's our direct connection to the actual tangible visceral life we're immersed in every moment regardless what our brains have to say about it. In other words, the military knows that you can't take life when you feel connected to life, at least not in the way that you would often be asked to take life. And men particularly routinely deny this powerful embodied connection to life that we cannot experience through our thinking brains alone. Yet this power center is what enables us to deeply feel our own lives, to feel the world, and from there to then create truly extraordinary relationships with other people and our in lives in which we thrive every day. Truly, when we live from this innate power source which connects us to life itself, we can make entire worlds thrive. And this power source isn't in our brains or our balls, it's in the heart. But we men tend to think of heart as merely something to help us win the close game or appeal to a woman's romantic side. But that's like thinking the sun is only good for burning ants. A man genuinely connected to his heart who lives each day with his brain and balls and proper service to his heart's deeper wisdom is a man that breathes life into the world. He can inspire and lift up the world, even if it's only one person's world. Now, how does a man connected to the heart show up every day? And not just when his team is down five points with a minute remaining. What does such a man look like? Well, let's dive into the five signs that a man is connected to heart. And I'm gonna share again my own personal experiences with, and please keep in mind that in, in many, ways this is an ideal that is worth living towards. I by no means have mastered all of these. I am in daily practice of all five of these signs that a man is connected to heart. So be gentle on yourself. <laughs> I wouldn't expect that you can get a hundred out of hundred on all of these. But let's dive in and let's see what resonates. Number one, he's deeply patient with himself, with others, and with life. When we're connected to heart, we're able to be patient with and authentically love life, love ourselves and love other people, even when they don't do what we want them to do, which is almost always. In the military, I was so disconnected from my heart that I essentially hated life. I was imprisoned in my brain. My only escape was sex. And the day I left base for the last time, I headed for the open road with only a backpack and pent up rage. Little did I know I was also heading into the darkest night my soul has ever experienced. And that dark night waxed and waned for 12 years and involved angry women and drugs and heartbreak and financial ruin. I was always impatient for the rest of the world to change so I could finally feel good. And I acted out in countless ways to make it change. By its end, my ego had been gutted so profoundly as I finally had to accept just how little I am in control of anything or anyone and just how messy life is, no matter what I do to keep it clean. With every smash against the rocks I took, every despairing night and furious girlfriend, the heavy armor surrounding my heart cracked and weakened until I gradually discovered an abiding peace and a laughter that I had never felt in my body before. Now, Rumi famously said, the wound is the place where the light enters you. And when I finally emerged from that dark night in which so many of my wounds reared their ferocious faces. I found myself in a new reality that showed me we are all innocent in our ignorance. We are each doing the best we can all the time, even when it doesn't look that way. I tell this part to couples all the time, that if we truly knew how to do things better, we'd do it better. We're not the enemies we think we are. And that one insight gave me access to an embodied patience with people, with myself especially, and with life that I had never known 
and that no one had ever taught me or even spoken of. And that insight was born of a freshly opened heart. And granted, my patience remains an, uh, what I like to say, an artwork in progress, for my brain and my balls still constantly seek to assert their authority. But my heart is no longer slave to my brain or my balls. I can move powerfully towards my true heart's desire, whether that be my woman or a trip to the tropics. And I can do so with patience enough to allow life its surprise curveballs. Because curveballs are half the fun anyway. And that's another way that you can recognize a man connected to heart. He makes most things fun. That's number two. He laughs easily and authentically and not at the expense of others. I didn't really know laughter until I was well into my 30s. Well, I laughed plenty before then, but I took myself and life so seriously that my laughter was shallow and intellectual. Only I didn't know that until the wisdom in my heart started showing me the wild beauty in all things. Rainer Maria Rilke wrote, if your daily life seems poor, do not blame it. Blame yourself that you are not poet enough to call forth its riches. For the creator, there is no poverty. Now my intellect has always been predisposed to lie to me by telling me things are, are worse than they really are. And my brain usually says, I gotta work harder, be better, do more just to survive. Never mind, thrive. And it says the same about you. And my balls, well, they're never satisfied for long. So it's hard to fully let go, or at least it has been hard, to fully let go and surrender to laughter when I believe I'm still not yet good enough, or that you aren't good enough, or that life isn't good enough. My heart, on the other hand, is perfectly content to enjoy this moment. It can find the innocence in most any situation, and it can laugh effortlessly at the crazy divine comedy that is life. The heart doesn't laugh in shallow arrogance through a facade of, I'm better and smarter than you. A man connected to heart knows we're all made of the same stuff underneath the surface gloss. The laughter that erupts from that place is profound, divine. It's like the sound of love tickling itself. Now, a few years ago at a couple's retreat I hosted, I saw something fascinating. There was a man in the room who loved to make jokes. And I saw him make a joke that was kind of um, deprecating towards the women in the room in relationship. It wasn't singling out anyone specifically, but it was just one of those humors, you know, kind of take my wife, please take my wife, kind of one of those kind of jokes. And the other men kind of chuckled, and I could see the women in the room were just deflated. It was subtle, but I could see their bodies slump, their faces kind of collapse, you know, their body. And I pointed that out just so that they could all see the effect of that humor. He was trying to diffuse a, a tense moment, and he did that for the men especially, but not for the women. He just created more stress in their bodies. And then later in the retreat, he made another joke that was embracing of everybody. It brought everyone into the, the, the humor rather than at the expense of somebody. And everyone laughed. And you could see everyone's body, the women's bodies, they, they, their faces, they all perked up. And they sat up and you could see it really relaxed. And it was really fascinating how the humor that he used has come from changed everything. And that's the thing, when a man is connected to heart, and it's a moment-by-moment -moment experience, in that moment, his humor embraced everyone. And it made a difference. It mattered. It created connection in the room. I see this a lot in the... I really struggle to go to comedy clubs in Los Angeles because there's so, so many comedians. Are, they're so rife with cynicism. It's all this anger coming out sideways. And they're laughing, and the room's laughing, but it's, it's so often at the expense of somebody. There's, a, there's an arrogance to it often, it seems. And I just don't enjoy it. I can feel in my body it doesn't feel good. right? So it's rare to find a comedian that really uplifts, um, but you can feel it in your body. right? And that's the sign that a man is connected to heart. His laughter 
is authentic and embraces the world rather than tears it down. And that leads me to number three. He's kind to the world. A man connected to his heart is kind to everyone. Now, that doesn't mean he likes everyone. It doesn't mean he tolerates everyone. He might even put someone in jail if they prove to threaten the world he envisions. He's capable of killing to protect and serve his family and his community. But he can always see the innocence that leads to ignorant, even awful behavior. A man connected to heart can hold compassion for the worst even as he locks the cell door. And I saw this in my relationships with women who acted in unskillful and even destructive ways because they did not know how to effectively communicate their pain to me. And I certainly was not an open hearted presence within which they felt safe because I was stuck in my head and I judged and fought them for their what I called immature behavior. All the while, I ignored the pain at their core. But with an open heart, I'm more able to stay kind with my intimate partner when she's acting out her pain. Now, I don't tolerate her hitting below the belt. I call it out. I have my boundaries. And by the way, uh, if you don't know how this works, I encourage you, go check out my boundaries program. Uh, boundaries, relationships suck without them. Uh, both Sylvie and I, we, we co-created that program. And uh, you know, men need boundaries too. And yes, like most things, this is an artwork. Boundaries are an artwork in progress because it's still easy for me to judge my partner. I judge her all the time, exquisite and extraordinary as she is. That's what the human brain does. The human brain judges. But in my heart, I don't believe in my judgments. I see through them for what they are. Just made up stories that at the very least do not take into account the actual experience of the one I'm judging. How could they? I've never lived her experience. I've never lived anyone else's experience. Which brings me to number four. He's fully present. A man connected to heart is fully present. Now I hear this all the time from women that their men don't seem to be present with them. Uh, the Gottman uh, research Institute, their love lab, where they've been studying couples in a laboratory setting for decades, they've found that women have two major complaints about men. The first complaint is this, he's never there for me. And the second complaint is, there isn't enough intimacy and connection. What does that even mean? Well, here's what I believe it means. Being fully present is a full body sport. It requires full participation of, yes, the brain, but also the heart and also the balls. When a man lives in just his head or just his balls alone, his partner won't feel him present. Of course, if he's just living in his heart, but there's no balls and no head, well, she's going to be frustrated there too. And by the way, I just want to acknowledge, I know I, know I frame a lot of my distinctions and work through a heterosexual context. I'm heterosexual and that's been my life experience. But I just want to acknowledge to my listeners that are not heterosexual, please know I do my best to uh, incorporate your... Um, uh, to consider you in the way that I present this material. And I know I don't always do a great job of it, but just I encourage you, please look for the, look for uh, what resonates. And even if you are heterosexual, and sometimes I may say something that doesn't resonate, throw it out, you know, find your own way, find, find what works for you. Uh, I'm a guide, not your guru. I, and I always reserve the right to be wrong. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Because I realize that I'm doing that now and framing this in a heterosexual context. So let's come back to it and again find the gift in this as it uh, is relevant to you. But when a, when a man lives in his head or his balls alone, his partner won't feel him present. And one way that reveals itself is through the quality of his listening. When I was trapped in the brain ball matrix, I would only listen to a girlfriend with the singular intent of evaluating how I was going to respond. I wanted to keep our thoughts in agreement because that's the only place I figured that peace of mind and then sex could happen. 
and my attempt to intellectualize every disagreement, every argument, every upset, however, mostly just created chaos. Because, But when a man connected to heart listens, he listens with his entire body, which, as I said, includes his brain and his balls. He doesn't just listen for a way into the outcome he wants. He listens with his whole body for the deeper message beneath the words. He listens at the level of heart where the, tr where the real truth often resides. And his partner can feel this. It's called his presence because he's breathing deeply. He's listening with his whole body. And I know this probably opens up a whole lot more questions. Like, well, what does that mean to listen with your heart, listen with your brain, listen with your balls? You know, my coach, a lot of the work that I've been doing over the, the, the last, gosh, you know, decade or so, um, some of the coaches that I've studied with, like Steve James and Michaela uh, Boehm, uh, who's I'm just fascinated to see her her rising to fame. She's been outed as the the intimacy coach to the stars, like Gwyneth Paltrow and uh, Will Smith. And anyway, I've been studying with Michaela for gosh, I don't know, seven years or so now, six seven years or so, and. So much of what I've been learning is just how to feel, connect with my own body, to be present with what's happening in my own body. And one of the things that I'll often do is when I notice, you know, when Sylvie and I begin to disagree on something and I sense particularly her upset increasing, that's often my first uh, warning sign, you could say, that there's a growing disconnect between us. She's starting to get agitated and upset. I often can't feel it in my body first. I'll notice it in hers because I'm listening. I'm paying attention. I'm watching what's happening in her body. Um, I'm practicing intimacy, which I love Steve James' uh, definition. And by the way, Steve, is uh, he was a guest on, I think, on like episode four or five or six, something like that. He's one of my first guests on the, on the podcast. Fantastic episode. Please go listen to it. It's amazing. Um but his definition of intimacy that he shared with me a few years ago is, is feeling what is there to be felt and seeing what is there to be seen. Feeling what is there to be felt and seeing what is there to be seen. I absolutely adore and love and appreciate that definition uh, of intimacy. It's opened up a whole new world of discovery and exploration for me. And coming back to when I have a disagreement, when Sylvie and I begin to, and it happens routinely enough. I mean, we do not agree on a lot of things. Uh, so, and those can, and in my past, th those disagreements would spiral into just awful uh, arguments and fights. I'm a, I'm a hothead. I got Puerto Rican in me. Um, and so, and, and even with Sylvie early in our relationship, especially, as we were just beginning to learn each other and trust each other and understand each other. And so even today, when I see uh, Sylvie begin to grow agitated, I sense her upset increasing. I will first off check into my own body and feel like, okay, whoa, what am I feeling right now? And, I, and oftentimes I'll notice maybe my arms are crossed, you know, and I'm breathing shallow. Right? So I'm starting to feel my own body. Oh, and I'll take a deep breath. I'll uncross my arms. In other words, I'll work with my body to open to her, to face her and open to her and relax my breath. She won't even know that I'm doing this. But when she starts to feel me open to her viscerally, physically, right, from my, from my brain, my thoughts, opening my thoughts to her, kind of allowing myself to be more curious to what she's experiencing, to what may be coming up for her. Um, kind of, you know, my balls, when I talk about my balls, I, 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 it's like my passionate force, you know, my drive, my root chakra, if you will. Um, a very primal part of me that wants to just penetrate the world with my presence. Um, you know, when I relax and I allow that penetrating energy to to orient around what's happening to her rather than just what I want to happen, but what's actually happening to her, right? So she starts to feel me open to her and paying attention to her and orienting my force towards what's actually going on for her, not what I want to be going on for her. She feels me not constricting my breath, right? So I'm not judging her, but I'm really listening and being present, feeling me, feeling her, she starts to feel safe. 
She always feels safe with me when I'm in my heart. So number five, he's passionately living his true purpose. The work I did in the military felt completely out of alignment with my true purpose, with what I felt like I came to this planet to do. I was miserable. And the day I left after five years active duty and another five years before that in my ROTC training at, at university, well, the day I left after 10 years of wearing a uniform, I instinctively knew to run fast and run far. And not just from the military, but from living inauthentically, living out of integrity with what my deepest heart knew to be true for me. Now, I had no idea what to go do. I had been doing what I didn't want to do for so long, and I find this a lot with the clients that I work with who come to me who've in some cases for decades have been working, doing the work and created a lot of success. I mean, have built companies and have wealth and, and realize that they've been just surviving despite all of their wealth and, and the resources that they've just been surviving. That they don't know what they want to do with their lives anymore. Most people just want to do nothing which is actually kind of what you need to do in a way to, uh, to, to, to discover your purpose. I mean, for me, when I left the military, the pain that I was experiencing, I had in the military, I had money, I had prestige, you know, respect. I was comfortable. I had job security. But I was miserable. And that left me with no choice but to seek my true purpose in life, wherever that journey would take me. And I literally threw myself into the world. This was back in the 2000 or so. Yeah, I got out in uh, the year 2000, right at the end of 2000. So 2001, January is when I set off into the world. And, you know, that's when I began my journey through a really painful darkness. Because to find my path of heart, I had to break the stranglehold that my brain and my balls had on my heart, the armor that I was wearing on my body, and that none of that surrendered graciously. A man connected to his heart, though, lives the truth inside that heart, whatever it looks like. If he's doing work he doesn't love, he's doing it, though, for bigger reasons driven by his authentic heart, perhaps to take care of his family or serve his community. In my case, after years of running from the imaginary security of a paycheck in search of authentic work aligned with my heart's desire, I finally found it in writing and coaching. And I'm really, really good at both. And I know that I make a meaningful difference in people's lives every day in this work. But I would have never got here if not for this journey of learning how to connect with the immense power of my heart. So those are the five signs that a man is connected to heart. Let's just summarize. And in this, as I summarize, I'm going to offer to you a practice for each one that you can work with, even if you just do it for the next seven days. And I encourage you to just choose one. I mean, try to do all five. You can try if you're an overachiever like me, but just choose one. Just choosing one could make a major difference in your life. Again, here's number one. He's deeply patient with himself, with others, with the world. So here's the practice. Cultivate patience. And you can do that with just a simple meditation practice. You know, meditation for me, I meditate every day. I have you know, five, five to six days a week. And often before I sit down to meditate, it goes through my brain that I don't have time for this. I'm busy. I got stuff to do. That's when it is so important for me to just sit even I just do it for 15 minutes. Sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll meditate as much as 30 minutes, but often it's just a 15-minute sitting practice. And even if nothing else, I'm cultivating patience uh, during that practice. Another, another thing you might do is when something in the world is upsetting you, just breathe. Whether it's your partner or a politician or something you read in the news or traffic, take a breath. Notice the constriction in your body and breathe. Breathe before you respond. Breathe before you go on social media and type something nasty. Breathe before you flip that person in the car next to you off. 
just breathe. That's it. Cultivate patience. Number two, he laughs easily, authentically, embracing everyone and everything in his humor. He sees the insanity in everything, but again, his humor doesn't merely resort to cynicism. It's almost as if he takes delight in the insanity of it all. His humor embraces the world. It doesn't merely dismiss it. So here's your practice. Have some fun. It's one of the things, I'm going to probably do a whole episode on this soon about having fun because I've discovered to my to my to my to my great sadness that I haven't been having a lot of fun in the last many years. It's like I've forgotten how to really have fun. And I've noticed as I brought this up in my my the various men's groups that I'm a part of and uh, help to lead that so many men aren't really having fun. We've forgotten, wrapped up in responsibility and 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 feeling the weight and the burden of of survival, no matter how much money we make and success still in this kind of survival mind. So um, ask yourself, what do you do for fun? Just, you know, non-productive, pointless, ridiculous, absurd fun. And if you only do that once a month or never, do it. In the next seven days, have some fun. For me, that's uh, been looking like going to the batting cages with my friends, uh, even playing video games. I don't have any video games on my phone, by the way, because uh, too addictive for me. I have a console because I can do it in a container and I can't take it with me outside of my, my little office man cave. Um, but it's fun for me. I really enjoy it. I have a good time. It makes me, oh, it's just fun. And, and, and um, you know, I've been cultivating the laughter for, for decades. And, and I'll also be very honest and direct with you that, that when I was in my early 30s, uh, mushrooms, psilocybin helped me gain access to my laughter to a laughter that I had not known in my memory. Um, so uh, I do mushrooms a few times a year. It's really a powerful medicine for me. I, I create a container for it, um, uh, a safe container. I'll do it with maybe one or two other people that I trust uh, in, a, in, a, in a natural setting. And so I'm not suggesting you go do that. That worked for me, and it continues to be a medicine for me. But what it does is it connects me to my body, and boy, it brings out a laughter that I don't forget when um, when uh, that journey, uh, when that state shift uh, changes, and I come back to just my normal mind. So, but anyway, the practices have some fun. Okay, number three, he's kind to the world. He's rooted in compassion. Doesn't mean he puts up with or tolerates injustice, but when he takes action to, the, to correct injustice, he does so from a place of deep wisdom. Understanding the innocence inherent in everyone's actions. Even Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. So here's your practice. Where have you been judging and condemning? An easy one these days is politics. So, can you cultivate compassion for someone you currently hold in heavy judgment? You know, you're still going to tackle the problems of your world, but can you do so, even the injustices you experience, without demonizing anyone as you tackle them? I don't mean tackle the people, but I mean de tackle the problems. Can you, can you not demonize anyone as you tackle the problems of your world? You know, people will oppose you, no matter your good intentions. That is the way of the world. As a blogger, some of the most liberating experiences I've had have come from just people writing comments in the blogs, critical comments. The most, my most favorite comment of all time, weirdly, was um, in an article that I was getting uh, hundreds of comments. It was being read by tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people all over the world, and Someone wrote, uh, most of the comments were overwhelmingly positive, but one was, one person said, this is the worst fucking article I've ever read, period. That's it. I knew in that moment I was free because that comment didn't affect me. It didn't hurt me. It didn't cause me to judge them back and engage in some kind of warfare 
I was just, in fact, in a way, I was almost, I was almost um, um, touched that wow, this this article really touched this person. Uh, that's saying something. The worst fucking article they've read and they've ever read in their history of their life on this planet. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so that's your practice. Um, you know, every criticism is an opportunity to open your hearts, to really listen to the other person's feedback. Find the gifts in their offering, even if it's just to check in with yourself to see if what you're doing in that moment is truly serving or, or maybe needs some reflection. You know, the feedback from the world around you can be a great, great feedback loop to help you truly live masterfully connected to your heart. All right. Number four is fully present. Again, presence is a full body sport. And here is a practice. Just breathing. One of the breathing techniques that I often teach men and women when I do a private solo coaching is we'll do some uh, meditating. And one of the directions I'll give is, can you allow your next breath to be a little more full without forcing it? Can you allow your breath to be a little more full without forcing it. We do so much damage through forcing our will on the world around us, on our own bodies. And this simple breath practice can teach you to be present to your own body. So you can be present to, let's say, your partner's body or to the world's body around you. Just this simple practice, even in this moment, wherever you're listening, can you allow your breath? to be a little more full in the next moment without forcing it. So that's a practice of presence. Try it, see what happens. And number five, he's passionately living his true purpose. Many men and many women will immediately identify with the veracity of this one. If you're not living what feels like your deepest purpose, I don't care how much money you're making or what impact you think you're having, it won't matter. You will be miserable. So practice. Each morning, ask yourself, what must I do today that by the end of the day I can sleep well knowing I did to the best of my, to, of my ability, I ability, knowing I did to the best of my ability what I came here to planet Earth to do? Another way of asking that for my advanced honor students is the question that my my, my friend and guest Satyan Raja posed for us in episode 12. What must I do to live, to love, and to die completely without regret today? What must I do to live, love, and die completely without regret today? Whatever that is, do it. And remember... If you're doing work today that doesn't really matter to you, but it matters to your kids because it pays for their shelter, their food, education, soccer practice, whatever, then I encourage you to consider that is a profoundly noble purpose. You don't have to do it, but you probably want to because on a deeper level, you know that this is a noble and necessary purpose. And outside of that, if you're working miserable for the sake of comfort or familiarity or you're just scared of change, consider the cost of that may be way larger than your bills. As my teacher David Data said, if you don't know your purpose, make it your singular purpose to figure out your purpose. And there's lots of ways to go about that. Maybe join a men's group in your area, or even better, hire a private coach for yourself if you want that kind of support. A huge part of my coaching practice is serving men and women along their own way to discovering and living their core purpose. I know I've been miserable when I was doing work disconnected from my deepest heart's purpose. And to conclude, I'll share an excerpt from my blog you're ready for all of her. You're a goddamn warrior. Deep in the marrow of your masculine core, you know you didn't come here to play safe and pass time simply scoring goals and notches on your bedpost or making money in fragile monuments to your pride. Hell no. You came here to throw down with life, 
to get bloody and muddy earth all over your soul as you charge gallantly each day beyond the edges of your hard-earned comfort zone. You are wise, ancient stardust sculpted into mighty earth come alive. You are a volcano with hot, molten heart at your core, risen to offer your authentic love even in the face of forces that would overwhelm lesser men. I know what's been asked of you in this lifetime isn't easy, but if you're ready to claim your birthright as a king amongst kings, a heart-centered warrior protector of the planet and all things true and good and beautiful, then it's time you learn how to love a wild woman in her deliciously untamable fullness. And to be clear, when I say wild woman, I'm not actually talking about a human. I'm talking about your heart. Thank you so much for listening. Find any links and resources and my five key practices at brianreeves.com slash men this way podcast. If you'd like to share feedback or share what this inspired in you, you can email me directly at brian at brianreeves.com. Again, it's brian with a Y at brianreeves.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode of Men This Way. And finally, if you were served by this and think others should hear it, please write a review so you too can lead more men this way. I want to thank those of you that occasionally reach out and even those that leave reviews on the various apps. Uh, just one came in just today from Rich Gozinya. I don't know if that's your real name, Rich, but man, I just want to appreciate your, um, your review. You said, love this dude and love this podcast. He's so cool and laid back, but also reveals his own stories and struggles in his life. Feels like listening to a friend. Man, it meant a lot to me. Uh, it meant a lot to me to hear that. So uh, I really appreciate that. And if you're listening to this and you were served by this and think others should hear it too, please write a review so that you too can lead more men this way. I read all the reviews and I really appreciate them uh, and I take them to heart. And don't forget to subscribe yourself while you're at it. I'm your thriving life and relationship coach, Brian Reeves, Brian with a Y Reeves. Until soon, keep your head up, your breath relaxed, and your thoughts inspired.